And I will begin by introducing our final speaker for the day. The Reverend William J. Byron S.J. is University Professor of Business and Society at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia. After service in the Army's 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment in 1945 to 46, he attended St. Joseph's University for three years before entering the Jesuit order in 1950 and becoming an ordained priest in 1961. Father Byron has served as president of the University of Scranton, the Catholic University of America, and interim president of Loyola, Loyola University, New Orleans. From 1992 to 2000, he taught social responsibilities of business in the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University, where he held an appointment as distinguished professor of the practice of ethics and served as rector of the Georgetown Jesuit community. Father Byron writes the syndicated bi-weekly column Looking Around for Catholic News Service Syndicate and is, is the author of more than a dozen books, including Quadrangle Considerations, which won the Catholic Press Association's 1990 Best Book Award in Education, Power of Principles, Ethics for the New Corporate Culture, and Next Generation Leadership. His latest book, entitled One Faith, Many Faithful, Short Takes on Contemporary Catholic Concerns, is due to be released this spring. Father Byron is a past trustee of Georgetown University, the University of San Francisco, and Loyola University of Chicago, and a founding director and past chairman of Bread for the World, an organization dedicating to eradicating, dedicated to eradicating world hunger. Father Byron has been the recipient of 30 honorary degrees, in addition to holding a doctorate in economics from the University of Maryland and two theology degrees from Woodstock College. Please join me in welcoming Father William Byron. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Good. Yeah, I had a friend who wrote a lot of books, and he said, I count my friends not by those who read my books, but by those who buy my books. <laughs> and I have to say, I count my friends not by those who sign up for a conference at Rosemont, but who really stick it out <laughs> and are here, here, here for the final, if not the main event. Uh, I was going to say, I'm not going to start until John Bogle shows up. <laughs> But I think we'd, be, we'd have a long, long wait. It's great to, uh, to come here. I, I'm amused. I, I did spend time. I'm a little older than I look, and I'm, I'm a WW2 veteran. And uh, on that resume, it's there. And nobody fails to pick it up that I was a paratrooper. So they always put that in the introduction as it was here today. And uh, just to distract you for a further moment, in those days, we didn't fly everywhere. My grandmother lived in Boston. We'd go by train to Boston. If you went to the Midwest, you go by train. I never flew in an airplane before I went into the Army. Uh, and uh, in my day, I was 18 in May, graduated from high school in June. I was in the Army in July. And I decided to get into the paratroopers, but the first time I ever went up in a plane was for my first jump. And then I had this riddle years later from my brother's kids, my nephews and nieces, and I would say, you know, I flew in an airplane seven times before I ever landed in one. <laughs> and they'd look at you that way. <laughs> but I have to tell you, it was good training for some of the work that I did later on as a university president, even as a classroom teacher. It's really terrific to be at, uh, at, at Rosemont. I logged in a few hours out here when I was a college student. They used to have a place called the Tea House. Yeah, you remember that, those of you who are alumni. Anyway, our topic at this hour. Uh, what does it tell you to do if your parachute did go? Well, you went out and you had a reserve chute on the front, a little chute that held in your, you could hold it in your arms. And your main chute was on what they called a static line that was connected to this cable in the airplane. And you went down that cable and then you went out as if to kick a football out the door and you had your hands on the reserve chute and you said 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. And if the thing, you would have fallen 79 feet and the thing popped. If it didn't pop, you pulled the reserve and you threw it up. The toughest part was landing, not going out. Going out was kind of fun. Anyway, if there are, if there are no further questions, <laughs> let me proceed. Uh, what I'm going to be speaking about is under the title of Old Ethical Principles for the New Corporate Culture. And when I think of eth ethical leadership in business, 
Two notions come immediately to my mind. One is culture, and the other is trust. And I'll comment on both in just a moment. But it may interest you first to learn about a conversation I had uh, some years ago now, a conversation I had about business ethics with James E. Burke, the former chairman of the board of Johnson & Johnson who is admired still worldwide as a model of integrity for his 1982 decision, some of you may remember, to pull Tylenol off the shelves all over the world, all over the world, because several Tylenol capsules were found to be laced with cyanide and they caused several, they caused seven deaths in the Chicago area, 1982. Now, I was involved in a research project that eventuated in that book uh, that, that's called The Power of Principles, uh, Ethics in the New Corporate Culture. And I was interviewing people, and Burke was one of the people I, I interviewed. And I asked him to tell me how he understood integrity. Uh, which, by the way, is one of the old ethical principles that I'll be uh, discussing here today. Uh, he said he summarized it all in one word, his understanding of integrity, and that one word was trust. Now, I'm quoting from Burke because I recorded the conversation. Tylenol was driven by a belief I had, he told me, there was no question as to what I had to do and what the company had to do. There were people in the company who questioned me, and there were those who disagreed with me, namely about that decision to pull the product off the shelves. But he continued, there was no question in my mind, you can't put a product on the market that killed seven people and not take responsibility for it. He said, the best way to take responsibility for it is to get rid of it and give the public what they should have had in the first place. The Tylenol case is a classic example, he said, of where trust worked. Now, he said, it wasn't our fault. It was laced with cyanide. That was done by some unknown enemy. But he said it was our product, and we were responsible. So off the shelves it came. Now, he, uh, he continued, he said a few more things that I want to say by way of preamble. Now, these are his words. People felt that the company could be trusted when I took that product off the market. I think it was a $56 million business then. That was an enormous sacrifice to make. I think the business is now, these some years later, I think it's now $1.8 it couldn't have happened, of course, without the fact that the public trusted us and trusted Tylenol. My whole claim in these areas is that trust is not only the only way, but it also works. And then Jim Burke added, the reason I stick with a trust thing is that it simplifies it all, meaning simplifies this complicated discussion about the principles of business ethics. His word would be trust. Now I want to say a word about culture because we're going to be talking about ethics in the new corporate culture. The famous uh, Canadian Jesuit theologian Bernard Lonergan defines or describes perhaps culture, these are his words, as a set of shared meanings and values. And there are as many different cultures as there are different sets of shared meanings and values. Now, we typically, in the popular mind, think of culture in terms of symphony orchestras and art museums and that sort of things. But cultures are sets of shared meanings and values. There's a youth culture. There's a Wall Street culture. There probably is a Rosemont College culture uh, the, you, you look at any place, and it was references made, Ron made a reference a few moments ago, there are a lot of cultures in any organization. 
you know, they're the people that play the pool. They're the play people that buy the lottery and share the tickets and all. And their shared meanings and values may be different from the shared meanings and values of others within that same organization. But think of organizational culture before you get to the specifics of ethics in a business organization. What is the culture that characterizes the organization? You should be able to find a clue in that organization's mission statement. Cultures are defined by dominant values, so it's important to identify the dominant value that defines the culture of the organization before examining the ethics of the organization. And of course, that dominant value should find expression in the organization's mission statement in my conversation with Jim Burke, he made repeated references to the famous Johnson & Johnson credo. If you've never read that, go on Google, just say credo Johnson & Johnson. It's a mission statement and it's really terrific. And it guided everything that that corporation then, it's a different story today as most of you know, that different cor uh, that, that, that corporation did in those days. Now, the old corporate culture in America was characterized by values like freedom, frontier, individualism, rugged individualism, competition, loyalty, thrift, fidelity to contract, or maybe just a handshake. You remember that? People said, we could do it on a handshake. Efficiency, self-reliance, power, and profit. They were values and they were there that characterized the old corporate culture. Now, if not, and this gets back to the conversation we had at the table a few moments ago, if not controlled by self or by social norms or by public law, pursuit of some of these values could be fueled by unworthy values like greed and the desire to dominate rather than to serve, and thus propel a person or a firm into unethical territory. Servant leadership has been mentioned earlier these days. That's a relatively new term. It's a great book, take a look at it. It's Robert Greenleaf, who lived in uh, Kennett Square, and he was a retired executive from AT&T, and uh, he came up with that notion of servant leadership. Just Think of how Christian that is. The Son of Man has come not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, Greenleaf in that book, Servant Leadership, is saying this is how the executive suite should look at the responsibility of leadership. And that, of course, implies a dominant value. Now, the new, or newer, or most recent corporate culture is defined by many, but not all, of those same values, although they're interpreted now somewhat differently. And there are some new values emerging in this new corporate culture. Whereas the old, let's just say 60 years ago, to look at the old corporate culture, whereas that would tolerate the employers not looking much beyond the interest of the firm's shareholders, the new corporate culture has grown comfortable, very comfortable, as you've heard earlier today, with the notion of stakeholder and sees, and, and sees an ethical connection between the firm and not only its shareholders, but all others who have a stake in what that firm does. Therefore, the employees, the suppliers, the customers, the broader community, and the physical environment in, within which that corporation operates. And that's just to name a few of the entities or persons that have a stake in what's happening in this particular enterprise. The outlook is now much, much more communitarian more attentive to the dictates of the common good. This is the new corporate culture. In the old corporate culture, 
You had a career for life with one firm. How many ever heard the term IBM lifers? You know, and they would describe themselves that way. When I left college, you know, I was that GI Bill crowd. We got a good education, and with that, we got good opportunities. And then they became lifers, some of them in the new emerging television industry. Dick Clark, you all read about his death, but guys like, these guys were friends of mine. Ed McMahon, Jack Whitaker, these people, they stepped into a, a new industry and they, they took off. And they were anticipating that they would be lifers in that industry. The new corporate culture is now explicitly contingent. No job is forever. Talk to your young people about that. There was an implied contingency in earlier arrangements that might be thought of as relational contracts that one had with a corporation. Even though both parties to corporate employment contracts thought and acted as if the relationship would continue uninterrupted straight through to retirement. Well, today's employment contracts are offered and received with a clear understanding that contract and career are not coextensive terms. That's an enormous cultural shift. For a simple, down-to-earth, practical illustration of articulating a dominant value, let me take you for a moment outside of the whole area of business and up to a summer camp for boys in Westport, New York, upstate New York, on the shore of Lake Champlain. It's called Camp Dudley. And it's been there since 1885. And it was founded by the YMCA and is now an independent corporation governed by a board of trustees and it operates as a non-denominational Christian camp for boys ages 7 to 15. And it operates under a motto that expresses the dominant value and thus defines the culture of that special place. And the motto is, the other fellow first. Think about that. You're the little tackers 7 to 15. <clears throat> the other fellow first. That's not really what they have between their ears when they come up to spend the summer at Camp Dudley. Now, for about 20 years, I spent a long weekend every summer at Dudley as a guest chaplain, one of a number of guest clergy male and female of different Christian denominations, invited to lead a noon Sunday interfaith chapel service. Uh, and it was in an outdoor, quote, chapel. Had about the dimensions of this McShane Auditorium that we're in right now, but it was all outdoor. And the seats were logs that were put across, and there were pine trees on the side. And up at the head, there was a platform with a little electric organ and, and the, uh, a podium where the chapel speaker would, would speak and the kids, their choir would be there. There was even a Dudley hymnal. All of these, these kids had, the, uh, uh, had, had their hymnal and, and great spirit about it. There was just, there was a vitality to that place and an impact on that place was just enormous. Now, some years ago, my visit to Dudley coincided with Parents Weekend. And soon after arriving on Friday afternoon, I happened to meet a couple from New York City. I won't mention the name, but it's a name that you would all recognize from the business world, the name of the father, but the mother was a Wall Street lawyer. So these were high-powered New Yorkers, Upper East Side there, and their little guy, eight years old, was his first time away from home. And they, we were just chatting, I was just, chatting with them as they were waiting for the youngster to be released from whatever he was doing to come over. And I noticed this little overweight, waddly guy kind of waddling up to say hello to his mom and dad. And uh, they introduced him to me. And just to make conversation, I said to this kid, what do you like best about Camp Dudley? His immediate response, nobody here makes fun of you. 
They had been explaining he had a few problems in his Upper East Side private, high-priced private elementary school. But now he was in an environment that was shaped by a value embodied in a motto, and that motto said, the other fellow first. And in function of that motto, it wasn't just concern for other people, it was no bullying, no making fun of other kids. That's just an example, and it's a non-business example of how a value wrapped in a motto, <clears throat> widely shared, can form a culture, and the culture can form and shape behavior. It also suggests the wisdom of encapsulating the organization's central value in a motto that conveys the organization's culture. I'm a Jesuit. Jesuit prep schools came up worldwide a few years ago with the notion of men and women for others. You know, some of the schools are co-ed. Men for others. It really catches it and it shapes the behavior of these kids. You know, you've seen it even like uh, the health system at Cornell University. The motto, Cornell cares. Now, if you're working there, you have to capture, you have to buy into that, Cornell cares. That means you who are pushing carts, you who are at the bedside doing nursing, you who are the surgeons, the physicians, Cornell cares. You can catch the motto and it will work anywhere. Slogan communication here on earth or out in cyberspace, but there should be the identification of a dominant value and then the recognition that this is a value to be shared. And that should be incorporated into the interview process when somebody comes to say, you know, I'm not here, I'm not here to answer your problem because you're looking for a job. I'm looking for you <clears throat> to help us answer our problem of how to run this organization to do whatever we do. And do you buy in to the values that we have? That's one reason why it's important to articulate those values in a mission state. Now, I could say a lot more about culture and capturing values and mottos, but let me move on uh, to a little more discussion about trust and then into my old ethical principles. The Journal of the Public Relations Society of America is called the Public Relations Strategist. And the cover of its fall 2003 issue calls the attention of the reader to Corporate America's new secret weapon, trust. That was on the cover. Corporate America's new secret weapon, trust. The cover story, written by a woman named Joanne Devon Reichard, Vice President of Corporate Communications and Public Affairs for Randstad North America. The cover story opens as follows, I'm quoting. Trust has seldom been more top of mind in America's break rooms, boardrooms, and corner offices than it is now. In fact, we are in the midst of a crisis of confidence when it comes to trust, one that has profound implications for us as social human beings and as professional communicators. The article goes on to say that mistrust is pervasive, <clears throat> and I think you would not find that surprising. It continues in these words, we've seen it in politics with special favors exchanged for political contributions. We've seen it in sports with investigations of cheating or lying by university coaches and little league teams that falsify birth certificates of star players. We've certainly seen it in business with accounting fraud scandals. Now, the author omitted any reference to scandals in the Catholic Church or church-related institutions, but those of us who serve in church-related institutions or in any form of church administration know that we have an enormous organizational ethics problem on our hands and that we have to learn, as this article puts it, that the building blocks of trust are consistency, clarity, courage, and a willingness to handle difficult issues. There were, in the business press 10 years ago, headlines, news stories, and editorials 
that might just as easily have found a place in the Catholic press if the Catholic press was going to report on what was going on. Now, th th this is from the front cover of Business Week, May 6, 2002. I'm quoting. The crisis in corporate governance, colon, excessive pay, weak leadership, corrupt analysts, complacent boards, questionable accounting, and then how to fix the system. Well, that's as if it set the agenda for the meeting that we've had here today. You know, how to fix the system. And <clears throat> with the exception of the excessive pay, that could apply to the organizational church as we know it. <clears throat> Now, one week later, and again, I'm going back 10 years, but one week later, the same magazine, Business Week, had this on its cover. Wall Street, colon, how corrupt is it? This is Business Week. On February 25th, 2002, Business Week's cover story pointed to, I'm quoting, betrayed, betrayed investors who had been misled by Wall Street corporations, accountants, and the government. The strength of the recovery hinges on winning back their confidence. Now, finally, Business Week cover of June 24, back in that same period, June 24, 2002, highlights a special report under the title of Restoring Trust in Corporate America, colon, why CEOs must speak up how institutional investors are pushing reform. You could just hear John Bogle applauding that and getting the institutional investors to push reform. Now, my point here, and, I, and I'll be moving to my 10 principles in a moment, but my point is that the church can learn a lot from what analysts say about corporate corruption, and <clears throat> the parallels are striking. Um, there is widespread suspicion and distrust in both arenas where decision makers have committed egregious breaches of trust. They're words taken from the business press, but they're applicable to the ecclesiastical side of the street. It's ironic, I think, that when the, the chairman of Arthur Anderson, uh, after the Enron scandal, when he... Uh, uh, when he uh, resigned, uh, he used religious language to explain his resignation as a sacrifice for the good of his employees. Now, although the bishops know that their corporate institution has a soul and lives on God's promise to be with the church until the end of, the time, end of time, they are now, especially since the release of, well, less than 10 years ago, of Robert Bennett's root cause analysis. Remember Bennett, the famous trial lawyer in Washington? He did a root cause analysis paper on that whole issue. And the bishops, in response to that, are thinking systemically. They can learn from what the business system has done and is doing in its efforts to recapture lost trust. Transparency, accountability, reform of governance, servant leadership, and patient listening. The ears are not merely ornamental. They've got to listen if they're going to lead. They're coming to the rescue of the business system. And all of these, along with humility, penance, and prayer, provide a formula to be followed by all who love the church enough to change it. The church will become stronger in its broken places if executive courage, not executive privilege, becomes the order of everyday ecclesiastical life. And this, it goes without saying, applies to everyday organizational life in any organization. And it is in this context that I want to speak today about organizational ethics in business. Now, for a period of about two years, I worked on a project that I think of as a study of old ethical principles for the new corporate culture. <clears throat> and that produced this book, which is called The Power of Principles. And it was in connection with this study that I spoke to Jim Burke 
uh, the uh, chairman of Johnson and Johnson. At that then he was retired. I spoke to him back in February of 2005. Now I'd like to list these old ethical principles for you. And I really invite you to consider how they apply in the organizational culture from which you came to this gathering today <clears throat> and to which you'll return when you go back to work, those of you who are not retired and are going back to work. I've identified 10 classic ethical principles, and I'll say a few words about each one, and I encourage you to come up with your own understanding of each one. Each one of you is the world's leading expert on your own opinion. <laughs> so it's important that you articulate your own opinion on these matters, and it's important that you assess how widely shared in your own organization are the understandings that you have of these classic principles. Remember now, a culture is a set of shared meanings and values. How widely shared are your meanings and values relative to these 10 principles. But just for a further delay of one moment before I list them, let me just say a word about the word principle. Jack Bogle got into that this morning, right? He talked about principle P-A-L, principle P-L-E. I taught, as you heard, at Georgetown in the business school, and I taught a course on uh, uh, corporate social responsibility, and, and it had a lot to do with principles. Now, I'm a nut working with young people about communication, oral and written communication. And I've often said that this generation of college students, and it goes back a couple of generations, they have the communications equivalent of bad breath. <laughs> and somebody has to tell them. So I would have students in front of the class frequently during the course of the semester, and I would have students write something every week and give it to me, and you know, I had, I had 70 minute periods Tuesday and Thursday, so I'd get it on Thursday, I'd mark it over the weekend, it would go back, and this went over the course of 15 weeks. So they'd have to write something, and I'd often say, you know, just for mercy on me, I had large classes, 50, 55 students, so that would be a lot to, to grade, I'd say, you're a, uh, you're a shareholder of Microsoft. Now your chairman has just made this speech. I want you to write a letter to your chairman and tell him what you think of it. <clears throat> or here's something from the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, this article on business. I want you to write a letter to the editor of the New York Times. I'd even say, you know, if you get it published, I'll guarantee a minimum of a B in this course. <laughs> a little bit of incentives. You know, it was a business school and you work with incentives. <clears throat> but I, I can guarantee you that if I were to do that tomorrow and stuff would be hand, handed in, I would get principle correctly spelled but misapplied in two or three of the essay. I'd get PLE when it should be PAL, PAL when it should be PLE. So after a year or two of that, I would take a time out at the beginning of the semester and I said, now look, the person who ran your secondary school, he or she, he or she was your pal. Now, you may not have recognized him as your pal, but the boss, the chief, the numero uno, that's your pal. The main event is principal, P-A-L. What we're going to be de dealing with in this course are principles, P-L-E-S, and they L-E-A-D to something. They put L-E-G-S under your values. Principles have to be internalized, and once internalized, they become promptings and they help shape your character, and you're gonna find that you're gonna be characteristically honest, characteristically fair, characteristically uh, committed, that sort of stuff. It's gonna help shape you. So that's what we're doing, and when I offer you these 10 principles, these are principles that I offered in class, and we had a lot of discussion about them, and I uh, wanted people to appropriate them and understand them, not just because I said this is it, but how do you understand integrity? How do you understand veracity? And how do you internalize them so that within yourself, 
they're going to prompt your external behavior. Principles prompt behavior. They shape decisions. They move to action. Principles, and obviously I'm talking PLES, are initiating impulses. They're internalized convictions that direct your actions and choices. Your principles help to define who you are. They are beginnings. They lead to something. So we focused on the principles, LES, of business ethics and the principles, LES, of corporate social responsibility. And here they are. First, the principle of integrity. I think of integrity in terms of wholeness, solidity of character, honesty, trustworthiness, responsibility. Now, what would you add or subtract uh, from that understanding? How would you articulate an understanding of integrity? And if you were in class with me over the course of a semester, you'd have plenty of opportunity to articulate your understanding. You'd also have opportunity to demonstrate the fact that you had internalized that principle, that you were a principled, P-L-E-D, person, and that one of those principles was integrity. Second is the principle of veracity. This, to me, involves telling the truth it also includes accountability and transparency. You could say that the person of integrity lives the truth. The person of veracity speaks the truth. But truth is really central to their understanding of behavior in the context of business. Third is the principle of fairness. Law is blind to justice. And if the trays are out of balance, that's indicative of an unjust and unfair situation. And what needs to be taken is compensatory action. Pensa, the Latin word for weights. If the weights are out of balance, the pensa, the weights have to be changed to bring the trays back in balance, balance and thus restore the situation of justice. You can have a lot of fun with that. And you can do a lot of social analysis by looking at the world through the scales of justice. And students can catch on to that. Let me say it now, it occurred to me earlier when we, in the previous uh, discussion, well, or two ago, or 22 ago, however long it's, it's, it's been, uh, when there was talk about education and what's gonna be done in this institute, there's a, an age old pedagogical question that has never been answered, and I'm not going to answer now, but the pedagogical question is, do you think your way into new ways of acting, or do you act your way into new ways of thinking? So if you want to teach students something about justice, Plato would say, get a clear and distinct idea of justice, and people are eventually going to understand it and act justly. Aristotle would say, no, have the experience of justice, or even better, the experience of injustice, and then you're gonna to come to an understanding of justice. So what was talked about, uh, service learning and all of that, the references made throughout the day, critically important to the way you educate people for ethics in business, that they've gotta have a chance to, you know, if you teach chemistry, you give lectures here, but then you take them into the lab next door and let them fiddle around and maybe blow the place up through the experiments. If you teach philosophy, if you teach literature, how do you get them into the, into the lab to experience that? You gotta get them out of the classroom, off the campus and into the experience. And there are a lot age appropriate uh, effective ways to direct students into those experiences. Okay, my fourth principle is the principle of human dignity. Now this bedrock principle of all ethics, personal and organizational, acknowledges a person's inherent worth. It prompts respectful recognition of another's value simply for being human. Now this is something that the young have to learn. Those little tackers at Camp Dudley, the other fellow first, they're learning something about human dignity. The students at Rosemont Villanova St. 
St. Joe's, wherever they are, Wharton School, uh, they've, they've got a way to go before they really understand a uh, human. They'll say, what's he worth? You know, what are they thinking? They're thinking of net worth. They're thinking of money. Uh, some guy will come up and say, my daughter's getting married, and the, the person he says it to, he says, what's he do? Oh, what's he do? He's a human being, not a human doing. What difference does that make? You know, but we have the great American secular heresy, and it troubles us in times of mass unemployment, as we've experienced now, that in America, what you do is what you are. And if you find yourself, quote, doing nothing, you're out of work, you may sadly conclude that you are nothing. And those who observe you say, oh, he's not worth much. No, he's, no. The principle of human dignity, and it's not contingent on your, your, your physical prowess, your net worth, your good or bad looks, your skin, your sexual orientation, none of that. Because you are a human being, you have title to dignity. The uh, next, and this is the fifth, is the principle of participation. Workplace participation would be important when you're uh, in a business school or talking about business ethics. Personal and organizational uh, uh, environments, uh, family even, require participation. Now this principle respects another's right not to be ignored on the job or shut out from decision making within the organization. Even students, you know, who sets the terms of trade in the classroom? Now they don't have control, I grant you that, but they should have a word in the burden of assignments, how many tests, how many papers, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, the teacher is still in control. You say, hey, you know, I'm not here just as a casual observer. I got something to say about what's going on. But the student should have a word in stating the terms of trade because they've got a right to participate. Think about that. It's broader application in the workplace. Six is the principle of commitment. What I have in mind here is that a committed person can be counted on for dependability, reliability, fidelity, and loyalty. They're all great values. But you take an organization that has widespread commitment, and the commitment is to the right values, you're gonna have an ethical organization. Seventh is the principle of social responsibility. We write books on it, teach courses on it. This points to an obligation to look to the interests of the broader community and to treat the community as a stakeholder in what the organization does. Much more could be said on that, perhaps in the discussion afterwards, more could come up. Eighth is the principle of the common good. And this operates as an antidote to individualism. It aligns one's personal interests with the community's well-being. This may indeed be the most difficult of all these principles around which to form an organizational consensus relating to the common good of the whole organization, and then relating that understanding to an understanding of the broader common good outside the organization. Ninth is the principle of subsidiarity. That's a word that came into the vocabulary of Catholic, the tradition of Catholic social teaching uh, back in 1931. Now, I'm sorry, did somebody say something? Sub, S-U-B, SID, S-I-D, I-A-R-I-T-Y. Now that gives you a visual impression you're putting something under, like a subsidy, submarine, subsidiarity, and I'll explain. This could be understood in terms of delegation and decentralization, keeping decision-making close to the ground. It means that no decision should be taken at a higher level of organization 
that can be made as effectively and efficiently at a lower level of the organization. And by the way, it's a principle that keeps government in its place. Not to say the government has no place up at the top level, but government doesn't have to make all the decisions. Government doesn't have to make all the calls. This could be viewed as a principle of respect for proper autonomy. It could also be understood in terms of Saul Alinsky's iron rule. Remember Alinsky, the community organizer in Chicago, who said, never, never do for others what they can do for themselves. It's good, solid principle. The principle of subsidiarity. Now, I think of that principle on the rare occasions when I have visited the FDR Memorial in Washington. Have you ever been there? You know, if you stand and look at the tidal basin and you'll see a building that Polly McShane's, John McShane of this auditorium built, the Jefferson Memorial, that would be at 12 o'clock. Over at three o'clock is a seven acre plot called the FDR Memorial. And that memorial has four architectural rooms, walls that go up, no roof, walls, it's open air. And it has inscriptions on the walls. It has inscriptions from each of the, the four inaugural addresses that uh, Roosevelt made. It has a little statue of Fala, the dog. It has a heroic statue of Eleanor, uh, uh, FDR's uh, wife. And there was controversy. They had a statue of Roosevelt, and they kind of disguised the wheelchair. You remember the infantile paralysis? And now they've blown the cover, uh, the, the cover on that. But there's also, over against a wall, I think this was the second term, where Roosevelt spoke of one-third of a nation, ill-housed, ill-fed, ill-clothed. There is a, a wall with a door leading into a soup kitchen, and there are sculptures, bronze sculptures of about five broken men, hats pulled down, collars up, and they're standing there in a bread line. One third of a nation, ill housed, ill fed, ill clothed. And when the kids come and platoons of them come every spring, they're probably there as we speak right now for tours, visits to Washington. And the kids run over this thing and they slot themselves in between these statues and they look out and have the souvenir photo to be taken back to Peoria, those kids don't realize that those figures represent their grandfathers, perhaps their great-grandfathers, and they don't realize that those broken men were saved by big government. Big government in the 1930s with the New Deal that started Social Security, that started, uh, you know, putting a, a, a platform of dignity and security under human beings. Anyway, that was an application of the principle of subsidiarity, as is the application when they say government keep out of this, hands off, we can make those decisions and set up those programs efficiently and effectively at a much lower level, closer to the ground. Now the tenth and final is what I call the ethical principle of love. And I see this as a principle, an internalized conviction that prompts a willingness to sacrifice one's time, one's convenience, and a share of one's material goods for the good of others. Now, it's a commonplace, as all of you know, to note that the search for organizational ethics will lead directly to the corner office, to the executive suite, to the person and character of the CEO. And that raises a question I will not explore here today, namely the presence or absence of a direct connection between the personal morality in the private life of the CEO on the one hand, and on the other, the organizational morality in the public moral person of a corporation, institution, or organized collection of the many persons who working under the leadership of a CEO try to achieve an organizational purpose. I presend from the question of whether a man who is unfaithful to his wife 
can lead an ethical organization or whether a woman who habitually lies to a friend can lead her organization to a high and consistent level of ethical integrity. It's very easy to judge, but it's hard to measure the correlation between the personal character of the leader and the institutional integrity of the organization. I don't attempt anything along those lines here, but it's a question worthy of careful consideration and study, and it's the kind of a question that will probably come up in the classroom in the work that will be uh, fostered here on Rosemont's campus by, that, uh, uh, by the Institute that we're, we're here today to, uh, to inaugurate and to, and to celebrate. But anything I want to say to you all comes back to a question of culture and trust. What is the dominant value that defines your culture? How widely is it shared throughout your organization? How trustworthy are you who are leaders in an organization? How trustworthy are you perceived to be by those you lead in that organization? How fully encompassing is the trust that generates the energy and purifies the air of the organization that has a claim on your time, talent, and commitment? How does trust become part of the life of your organization? It begins with persons, and it has to begin with the small things, the courtesies, the reliabilities, the acknowledgments, and a genuine institutional humility. Is the person of the CEO, the occupant of that corner office, is the occupant of that corner office there to be what a friend of mine used to teach at Notre Dame, Dennis Goulet, used to say as the essential characteristics of an executive, availability, accountability, and vulnerability. They're the three essential characteristics. If you've been there, you'll understand what he means by vulnerability. You're the guy or the gal who takes the harpoons. If you have been an effective CEO, you'll agree that availability and accountability belong in the executive toolkit. Think for a moment of all your associates all those who work in your organization, think of them within the framework of trust and recognize that your organization cannot operate without social trust, without the social collaboration of human beings. And the way you create trust is to have a complete transparency in your decisions. And you can say, is yours a high trust, low trust, or no trust organization? Now, if your organization is a caring community built on a foundation of mutual trust, you'll be conducting your affairs far beyond the low altitude horizons of corporate compliance, and you'll have found the bedrock of corporate integrity. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today, and we've got some time left, I know, so we can get commentary and then maybe open up for some questions if you have them. Thanks a lot for your attention. <laughs>